Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on COVID-19 from 2020 American Society of Hematology meeting webinar. I'm Nikki, and I'll be the operator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from three expert speakers, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the webinar interface. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you're listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. Now I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. And thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us today's update on COVID-19 from 2020 American Society of Hematology meeting webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors of this webinar, Genentech, Cariofarm Therapeutics, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Before I turn the program over to our speakers, I want to briefly share information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. The Lymphoma Research Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment-specific resources, programs, and services all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. In addition, we have launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. If you have any questions regarding what you heard about today or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to the LRS through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today with three expert speakers, and I'm honored to first introduce you to Dr. Lori Sen to discuss lymphoma and COVID-19 updates from ASH. Dr. Sen is a hematologist and chair of the Lymphoma Tumor Group at the University of British Columbia, where she also serves as a clinical professor of medical oncology. She's also an associate editor of the scientific publication Blood and has served as an expert speaker at numerous patient programs at LRF. Thank you for speaking at our program today, Dr. Sen. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Dr. Sen, are you on the line? Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to participate today. I think that this is obviously very topical and at the forefront of everybody's mind, so I appreciate the opportunity to discuss what I think is a very important topic. So I am a lymphoma specialist uh, here in Vancouver, Canada. I've included some of my disclosures here today uh, for transparency. And mainly over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to be discussing some of the concerns related to COVID-19 in patients with lymphoma. So we know that COVID-19 um, represents a threat, of course, to everyone and, and the general population at large, and hence we've had huge modifications in our lifestyle, and there are recommendations for protection for everybody. But we understand that the people who might be at greatest risk of COVID-19 are certainly those who are older and have medical problems, those who have an underlying problem with their immune system, so suppression of the immune system, and those who might be receiving treatment that can cause suppression of the immune system. So based on that description, we're particularly concerned that patients with lymphoma might be at a higher risk of not only contracting COVID-19, but also if they do contract COVID-19, experiencing more severe symptoms and complications related to it. So it has definitely modified how we think about treating patients with lymphoma, and physicians have needed to reconsider many of the decisions they make in the course of routine care. I think that it goes without saying that the goal for everyone is really 
and need to balance uh, a treatment for lymphoma to make sure that we're still optimizing treatment for individual patients, while at the same time protecting patients from the risks of COVID-19, as well as the healthcare providers that are involved in the care of patients. And also we realized that COVID-19 has put a big burden on the healthcare system and some of the resources are being strained. So when we think about how we might modify treatment to accommodate for this new era that we're dealing with right now with COVID-19, we need to think about as well, you know, how some of the decisions we make might impact healthcare utilization and how some of that utilization might be limited uh, or limiting our ability to access some options right now. So important considerations when we think about selecting treatment is, is treatment really necessary right now? How can we minimize some of the tests that we do and the procedures that patients go through? If we're going to consider treatment, are there some treatments with less risks of side effects and immune suppression, and perhaps those would be preferred right now? And also, as we deliver care, you know, can we deliver this in a more virtual way to limit everybody's direct exposure? So with these considerations in mind, as you can imagine, when COVID-19 uh, became a reality for all of us, most of us, you know, didn't have information to rely on. And, and so one of the important resources that was created was the American Society of Hematology immediately started to convene expert panels to put their heads together and to consider the dilemma that we're now facing to provide recommendations for healthcare professionals and how they might handle patient care in the setting of COVID-19. So these expert panels have been convened and uh, guidance and recommendations from the panels are now available on the ASH website. And importantly, they are constantly updated. So as the situation evolves, um, and as we learn more about COVID-19 and its effects on lymphoma care, these recommendations are updated. So I think it's important uh, to know that they're out there on the website, they're available for healthcare providers and even patients to review. What are some of the basic guidelines that the panel ultimately recommended? Well, we know that you know, COVID-19 testing is highly important for patients who are exhibiting symptoms that are reflective of COVID-19. That's true for the general population, but uh, particularly for patients with lymphoma, I think we should have a lower threshold for testing patients with any related symptoms. Importantly, anybody considering new therapies should probably be tested for COVID-19 to make sure that there's no uh, asymptomatic or active disease prior to starting. And I, I think many health professionals are also testing patients prior to them visiting either hospitals or even clinics to ensure everybody's safety. I think there's a general consensus right now that if we can delay therapy, uh, that would be preferable. So we know that not all lymphomas need to be treated at all times and patients particularly with indolent and slow-growing lymphoma. Sometimes we can defer therapy. And, and right now, you know, in settings where therapy can be deferred, that certainly should be considered. They are recommending virtual visits whenever possible. Again, this serves to limit the exposure of both patients and health care providers, decreasing lab tests and keeping these to a minimum. Also, when we think about selecting therapies, it's important to consider if there are different therapies available, selecting the ones with the least effect on the immune system would probably be preferable right now, certainly to keep the immune system strong. Also, this is relevant as we think about the vaccine that's forthcoming um, to ensure that people have the best capacity to respond to it. If there's an option, oral therapies can be preferred over IV therapy right now, again, with the idea that this will limit exposure to people you know, within the healthcare environment. The use of growth factors in any supportive medications that might reduce the risk of complications would also be desirable. And then uh, finally, when we do encounter people with lymphoma who actually acquire COVID-19, I think that we know very little 
about treating COVID-19 in the setting of lymphoma care right now. And, and certainly these decisions will need to be individualized on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, depending on the severity of COVID-19, any treatment that the patient's receiving, and as well, the activities of the lymphoma. So what did we learn from the American Society of Hematology annual meeting, which took place in December of this year? There were some uh, very interesting reports that were reviewed as, within the context of this meeting. The first one I'll mention um, stems from the American Society of Hematology Research Collaborative Data Hub Registry. So, um, again, understanding that when COVID-19 came on the scene, we had very little information to rely on to guide management in patients with lymphoma. So there was a desire to acquire this information in, in real time so that we can learn from our experiences moving forward. And ASH was very instrumental in setting up an important database, so a, a registry of patient information. So this is an active registry available on the website, and its goal is to uh, include information on patients who develop COVID-19 in the setting of hematologic conditions and particularly hematologic malignancies. So healthcare professionals worldwide are asked to provide information on, on information on patients that they encounter to this database so that we can compile this information and ultimately not only learn from it, but use it to provide guidance for healthcare professionals. So at ASH this year, they updated the status of this registry. Uh, we've learned that information has been contributed really worldwide to this registry with, at the time of reporting, almost 700 patients included in the registry. You can see that a fair proportion of them actually came from North America. And about a quarter of all the patients registered actually were people with lymphoma. Looking at outcomes of patients who have COVID-19 with a background of hematologic malignancies. On this bar graph, you can see that the information is divided according to the severity of symptoms that people had at the time of presentation, as well as age. The blue bars represent people that had COVID-19 and actually recovered from, uh, from the illness, and the red or pink bars uh, represent people that unfortunately died secondary to COVID-19. And I think it's important to recognize that the majority of patients enrolled within the registry have recovered despite experiencing COVID-19, but we can see that the risk of mortality is significant. Um, this is a fluid database and information is changing as we acquire it, but we can see that more than 20% of patients um, in the database actually died due to COVID-19, which is a mortality rate that we uh, understand is much greater than the general population at large. We can also learn from this curve that the patients at greatest risk from death of COVID-19 are those who present with the most serious symptoms, but also those who are older in age. So I, I think from data like this registry, we can see that uh, our concerns that patients with lymphoma and other hemologic malignancies may actually represent a more vulnerable population seem to be true, that the general risk of mortality seem to be higher in people with hematologic malignancies. This database, as I said, is still being required, and as more information comes in, we'll be able to dissect it and, and look more closely at individual patient uh, subtypes. But right now, it's certainly uh, has caused alert that we need to be aware of this vulnerability and continue with our important precautions for patients with lymphoma. Another important data set that was presented at ASH was a actually represents a meta-analysis. So we know that there's a lot of information coming out in the medical literature. Uh, many institutions are presenting their own data, and, and really this was an attempt to compile all of the information out there in the literature. So, oops, sorry. Um, the goal of this was really to 
look at the literature in its totality and and to look at the mortality risk from COVID-19 and to see whether or not there are any predictors for mortality from COVID-19. Ultimately, these authors included 38 studies in total, which included more than 3,000 patients with COVID-19 and hematologic malignancies. And you can see here, similar to the last presentation, that the risk of mortality was quite significant. In this study, 34% overall. I point out, though, that 77% of these patients were hospitalized. So one of the risks of looking at this literature is that probably reflects the worst case scenario. So we know that many patients who are asymptomatic don't make it to the attention of their doctors, don't land up in the hospital. They may be underreported. So well, we have to recognize that, you know, the risk is there. Some of these reports may, in fact, overrepresent the, the seriousness of that risk. But looking at the subsets that were looked at within this meta-analysis, you can see that the greatest risk for mortality was seen in patients who are older. Uh, the non-white versus white population had a greater risk. And as well, patients who had been recently treated with anti-cancer therapies and immune suppressive therapies at a greater risk. So these authors concluded that, in fact, we, we can recognize that mortality from COVID-19 does appear to be high in patients with hematologic malignancies, that we need to be aware that age and treatment are potential risk factors. But importantly, they also concluded that the majority of patients do survive and recover. I'll point out one last uh, compilation of information. This is also a, an existing registry designed to capture patients with COVID-19 and broadly a cancer diagnosis. At ASH this year, they reported the group of patients in their registry that actually had a hematologic malignancy. So this reflected about 1,000 patients with hematologic malignancies who had developed COVID-19. They were able to break it down by the type of hematologic malignancy. So looking here, we can see that uh, of the patients who presented with non-Hodgkin lymphoma and COVID-19, their risk of Developing severe COVID-19 was actually quite high, just under 40%, and uh, they had about a 20% risk of mortality. Looking at patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, those risks were a little bit less, which might reflect the fact that patients with Hodgkin lymphoma are slightly younger in general, sometimes with less, um, other, uh, less medical problems but still their risk of severe COVID-19 was quite substantial, about 20% and 9% of those patients experiencing death due to COVID. They also looked closely at the risk of um, COVID-19, severe COVID-19, uh, in relationship to when patients had been most recently treated. And it was clear that patients who had been recently treated, either currently or within the last three months, the risks of severe symptoms and mortality were actually much higher than patients who had not been treated recently. So patients who had not received treatment for the last three to 12 months actually had a lower risk. So again, um, sort of affirming what we anticipated, that patients receiving immune suppressive therapies are at a higher risk. I'd like to point out one additional study. So, you know, why are people with lymphoma or those receiving treatment at highest risk? Well, we expect that they may not be able to mount a proper immune response against COVID-19. This study actually looked at trying to measure the immune response that people can develop in the setting of COVID-19. And they looked at that response, particularly in patients who had recently received anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. So drugs like rituximab, which are frequently used for lymphomas. And although this is a little bit hard to interpret, what it did show us was that for people who had received recent treatment, including anti-CD20 antibodies, the likelihood of making antibodies to COVID-19 when they experienced infection was quite low, which might explain why the risks of mortality are higher in people who have lymphoma. In that regard, we're also concerned about whether or not people who have lymphoma will be able to respond to the upcoming vaccines. 
I won't be talking about vaccines in detail because we'll broach that topic very shortly, but I'll mention what the current recommendations are for patients with lymphoma with regards to the vaccine. So we know that the vaccine trials do not include immunocompromised people, such as patients with lymphoma. However, based on the nature of vaccines that are currently available, we do feel that the harm should not be significant and the benefit certainly does outweigh the harm. So it is recommended that patients with lymphoma receive the COVID vaccine when they are able to. Um, and the timing of that vaccine should probably be discussed with their physicians to make sure that we can optimize the benefit of the vaccine. And probably as a side, I'll just mention that the flu vaccine is also currently available and would also be recommended at, um, as well. This is just my last slide, and I think it's quite sobering. So this reflects a recent, recent patient survey performed by the Lymphoma Coalition, which is a group of uh, patient advocacy groups of which the Lymphoma Research Foundation participates. But every year they perform a patient survey. This is a survey of patients with lymphoma looking at some of the psychosocial aspects of the disease. And interestingly, they compared patients' experiences in 2020 to patients in 2018. And across the board, if we look at measures of anxiety, measures of depression, uh, isolation, concerns uh, about treatment outcomes, all of them seem to be higher in 2020 compared to 2018. And it's felt that a lot of that reflects the added anxiety that everybody has related to COVID-19. And I think not only we need to think about it, it may not just be the added anxiety of dealing with disease in the context of uh, the pandemic, but also based on all those healthcare changes that have come into place because of COVID-19, I think we need to be concerned that, um, that physicians and, and the healthcare system is providing enough support for people um, in this new world that we're currently dealing with. So I'll, I'll just use this uh, as a way to remind everybody that you know, our goal is not only to provide effective care, but to make sure that, that people and, and patients and families are supported through this, that I think COVID-19 has added an extra burden of anxiety, and, and everybody should be making sure that they're accessing all of the support services available through their local facilities and through organizations like the LRF to ensure that they're getting the support that they need. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sen. Um, that was a wonderful, comprehensive overview. Um, for everyone, please just save your questions uh, for the end as we'll do a, a brief Q&A then. Um, but without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anthony Mado, who's going to discuss CLL and COVID-19 updates. Dr. Mado is a hematologic oncologist and director of the CLL program at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where he also oversees numerous clinical trials on CLL. In addition, he has served as an expert speaker on numerous patient programs for LRS. Thank you so much for speaking today, Dr. Mato. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, and Lori, a really excellent talk. I actually learned a lot from that presentation. Um, I'm gonna focus on patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. I have a lot of information. I'll try to get through as much of it as possible and stay on time. So I'll start off by discussing COVID-19 in patients with CLL. Uh, patients with CLL are at a particular risk for severe or symptomatic COVID-19, and this is probably due to multiple factors, including their advanced age of diagnosis, the many comorbidities that they can have, and the fact that the disease itself and also the therapies we give patients uh, may cause some immunosuppression and affect the response to the virus. There's no data yet to support whether patients with CLL are more likely to be infected, speaking to the prevalence of it. And probably the, the limited data that we have at this time suggests that CLL patients are at the same risk as everybody else for being infected. It's just that they're more likely to have severe infections. So how do we think about COVID-19 in the context of CLL therapies for patients who are actually on treatment? And there's two different groups of patients that we focus on when we're in clinic. Those that are currently on therapy, so you're on a BTK inhibitor or venetoclax or chemotherapy, and there are potential consequences for stopping the CLL-directed therapy in the setting of COVID-19. And so we're always thinking about the balancing act of stopping a therapy in order to improve the immune system versus stopping it and 
putting patients at risk for developing progression of their disease. And then the second major group of patients um, that we think about are those who are starting a new therapy, and how can we select the most effective therapy with the goals to control the disease, suppress immunity, and also minimize the need for frequent visits to the office. So it's a, it's a balancing act for those on therapy and those who are about to start therapy. And now I'm going to go through some common sense that have been recommended by experts in the field for patients to minimize the risk of developing an infection in the first place. Of course, we think about um, social distancing being critically important, at least six feet apart, hand washing, use of sanitizers, hygiene, protective gear, which everyone should be doing. That's some things to minimize, including travel, particularly to affected area, exposure to public and or uh, other places like medical centers unless they're absolutely necessary, and then utilize some things like telemedicine uh, for CLL visits and related care, omit routine testing if possible, and then, of course, what everybody's learning this year and last year is work-from-home strategies. But what about testing and screening? What are the recommendations? Of course, we should test anyone who's symptomatic, even if the symptoms are mild. We want to test patients before they're admitted to the hospital, particularly to minimize the risk of infection to other patients and staff. Test asymptomatic patients approximately a day before they start therapy to minimize the risk of starting a therapy in the setting of active infection. And then during flu season, make sure we're doing concomitant testing for other viruses like the flu, for example. And then during treatment, question patients for symptoms over the phone or at the clinic door to minimize, again, the risk of exposures. But what about CLL therapy during COVID-19? Well, in areas where there's active disease, meaning a very high uh, percentage of people who are testing positive, if possible, think about postponing therapy. If a patient requires immediate therapy and there are multiple choices, try to focus on things that minimize exposure for patients to the healthcare system. But of course, again, that same old balancing act of making sure we're not um, cutting corners and that we're giving patients the best possible therapy. We try to minimize uh, potential therapies can suppress the immune system. Early on, we were more focused on minimizing therapies like venetoclax because of the complexity of the ramp up. With time, I think the community is leaning towards just focusing on what's the best therapy for a patient and less so avoiding one therapy over another, one, one therapy over another over time. And in areas where COVID-19 is under great control, uh, and of course that's a, a moving target, we should follow standard guidelines for the initiation of CLL-directed therapy. But what about modifying therapy in a patient who develops COVID-19? So you, you develop COVID-19, you have some symptoms, what do we do? Well, if you have mild symptoms, the recommendations are not to modify therapy. If, if there are more severe symptoms, it really depends on the status of the CLL and the infection history versus risk of COVID complications. And right now, the, the data are very scanty in whether patients should be continued or not on therapy in the setting of severe infection. Uh, generally, if a patient's in the hospital, we've likely held therapies unless that patient's at particular risk for developing rapid progression of their disease. And of course, if a therapy is held and you hold it until recovery from the infection, you can resume targeted therapy after patients meet some basic criteria like your symptoms are gone for a couple of days, it's been at least 14 days since the onset of the symptoms, and that you have had a, a repeated test that shows um, that the virus is no longer present. Well, there are different measures for supporting patients during this current era, and some of these are very important. Patients with CLL can have low antibody levels. We call that hypogammaglobulinemia or just low IgG or low antibody levels. For patients who are getting infusions of antibodies, we recommend to continue them, uh, possibly switching from the office to home infusions if possible. We might change the threshold for which we're initiating therapy or continuing therapy or how frequently we're giving it. But generally, we think that should continue. I'm in clinic right now seeing patients and a mainstay of our program is to vaccinate patients against infections that can be vaccinated against. Those include influenza, strep pneumonia, and I'll talk a little bit at the end about the COVID-19 vaccines and where they fit into the particular um, landscape for minimizing risk of infection with patients with CLL. And then I won't go into great detail, but it's just to say that some of the therapies we give patients can cause symptoms that are very similar to COVID-19. Uh, and they can also cause other infections, which can be similar to COVID-19. So it does require a CLL expert in partnership with infectious disease specialists to try to evaluate symptoms and determine what they're due to. Um, now I'll delve into some of the CLL-specific data 
And I want to just start off by mentioning that all of these data that I'm going to mention were captured very early in the pandemic when we knew very little about COVID-19 and our, our expertise in how to manage it was somewhat limited. And so these data likely represent the most severe sick patients who had access to testing in the U.S. and Europe. This is a study that was presented by the ERIC Consortium, their European physicians, and they looked at a large group of patients in Europe who were diagnosed with COVID-19, and some of the take-homes from the study were that older patients, older than 65, had a higher risk of dying from it. Um, about a third of patients were being treated at the time of diagnosis, two-thirds were not, and that about a third of patients, these really, really sick patients, ended up dying from COVID-19 infection. So a sobering number, which I think has improved somewhat over time. This is the mortality I mentioned. The, the mortality for severe disease, which was most patients in the study, was 36.4%. But again, keep in mind, these were the sickest patients who had testing, who had testing available to them. There's additional data presented from Italy, and the reason I included this was that they suggest that only about 0.5% of patients with CLL have contracted COVID-19, which really speaks to the fact, very similar numbers in, you know, in the population in general, that about 0.5 to 1% of people have been infected with this virus altogether. Uh, these are additional data who were presented on patients who were receiving the BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax, and the take home here was that the mortality rate early on in the pandemic was about the same as it has been for other patients with CLL. And I think the largest study completed to date was one that we led here at Sloan Kettering in partnership with other centers, where we looked at nearly 200 patients very early on in the pandemic. Uh, average age was about 70, 71. About 90% were hospitalized. So again, the sick people who had access to testing, uh, about a third of patients, about 40% uh, of patients were not being treated at the time of this uh, investigation. And very similar to what was found in the Venetoclax patients and the Italian patients and the Spanish patients and the larger European study was about a third of patients ended up dying from disease. We haven't published it yet, but some updated data suggests that those numbers are actually getting much better. This is just some more information from our study about the um, patients who were treated versus watch and wait. And what we found interestingly, and this is a warning to all patients with CLL, is that we didn't see a large difference in survival, whether patients were watching wait or whether or not they were treated, suggesting that everybody needs to have equal caution. And then a little bit more was presented in a combined analysis from Europe and the U.S. by my colleague from Sloan Kettering, Dr. Lindsay Roker, and she actually looked at 411 patients across 141 different hospitals, again, very early in the course of the pandemic, and then found some similar survival rates. And this was presented at the most, ASH, the most recent ASH meeting, about 30 to 34% for hospitalized patients. Well, what predicted patients who were likely to get into trouble with COVID-19? Age seemed to be important. The number of medical comorbidities or other illnesses uh, that were present were really the two most important predictive factors. I'll also highlight some of the potential therapies uh, that have been thought about for CLL patients with COVID-19 highlighting BTK inhibitors like ibrutinib and acalabrutinib, which early on there seemed to be some theoretical um, suggestions that these drugs might dampen inflammation and therefore potentially lead to less damage to organs like the lungs. The take home from all of it is that there's been very limited data for drugs like ibrutinib, for drugs like acalabrutinib early on that suggested possibly there could be that decreased risk of um, inflammation. But to date, there have been a few studies now conducted, one uh, published in the context of a press release, so kind of take that with a grain of salt, suggesting that the BTK inhibitors are probably not a mainstay of therapy for treating COVID-19 at this time. Certainly, if you're on them, I don't think that they cause any harm, but they're probably not protecting people from infections, and we have very little evidence to suggest that they may be minimizing the risk of inflammatory responses from infections. And I've kind of glanced over just some of the trials that are ongoing which have not yet been reported. Some other advances in terms of therapeutics include dexamethasone, which is a corticosteroid and anti-inflammatory, which did seem to have some uh, evidence of um, improved outcomes uh, from a, this is a European study, a British study that was presented, which suggested for really sick people, those in an ICU or on oxygen uh, or receiving mechanical ventilation, that there was an improvement in survival. Of course, remdesivir is an antiviral that has been given emergency use authorization by the FDA. 
And there was a hint that there was some improvement in terms of recovery time, a significant improvement in terms of recovery time, uh, but no clear improvement in making patients live longer. So this is a tool we have for fighting the virus, but generally it's not likely to fix the problem completely. And there have been two monoclonal antibodies uh, approved by, actually three monoclonal antibodies approved for two different companies, one um, from um, Eli Lilly and one from um, Regeneron, where these therapeutics uh, may be able to help uh, stop the virus viral replication and induce an immune response. Very limited use in my practice, so I can't really speak to um, speak to their success in, in CLL patients. But what, can, what I can speak to is the fact that these drugs are useful early on. And so this is not for hospitalized sick patients in an ICU. These are generally outpatients with mild symptoms of COVID-19 with the hope of preventing severe disease. Convalescent plasma was touted very early by, in the news and the media as a potential um, benefit for patients. Right now, there may be a trend towards some improvement in outcomes, but in this study from China, it didn't actually improve survival for patients, so probably not a very important tool for managing COVID-19. I think one of the most important um, studies presented to date was also published by my colleague at MSK, Lindsay Roker, where she looked at 21 patients in our practice who had documented COVID-19 and then tried to determine what proportion of them developed an antibody to the virus, and about two-thirds did which probably speaks to the fact that, that the vaccines will be active and effective, but may not be as effective in CLL patients as they are in the general population, which is what we already know from other vaccines like influenza and pneumococcal and Shingrix. This is just a little teaser on the vaccines that exist. This is the Pfizer data. Not a lot of oncology patients or maybe no oncology patients participated, certainly none with CLL, but the efficacy was 94.6%. It appeared to be incredibly well tolerated. Uh, serious events, serious side effects occurred in 0.6% of patients. This is the data from um, AstraZeneca, which suggests that the efficacy of this vaccine, which is not yet approved or even given an emergency approval, ranged between 70.4% and 90%, depending on the schedule and dose of how the vaccine was given. Uh, again, pretty well tolerated. And this is data from the Moderna, I believe, a vaccine, which is given over two doses, which also showed about 94.5% 90, efficacy and very well tolerated. So finishing on time, my key takeaways are the best ways to minimize the risk of morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 is to practice social distancing to avoid exposure and infection. Infected patients with CLL may be at an increased risk for developing severe COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. Current therapies under investigation for COVID-19 appear to off offer modest benefit for patients with severe disease requiring hospitalization and maybe some benefit for those who are yet to be hospitalized. No accurate data available regarding timing of COVID vaccine and efficacy data in immun immunocompromised patients. That's not just CLL. And the community of CLL experts are active in providing guidance for modifying um, selecting therapies, minimizing risk of infection, and optimizing methods to prevent secondary infections during the pandemic. And a special thanks to the Lymphoma Research Foundation for organizing programs like this that really allow experts in the field to provide our thoughts and recommendations to patients. And thanks so much for participating. I can stop there. Great. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mater. That was um, really in-depth, and I know our um, CLL patients and caregivers really appreciated those updates. And um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Emily Landon, who's going to give an overview of COVID-19 and vaccines. Dr. Landon is the Executive Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control at University of Chicago, where she is also an Associate Professor of Medicine and an Infectious Disease Expert. She has also guided the University of Chicago and other affiliates through the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you so much for speaking at our program today. I now turn the talk over to you. Hey everyone, thanks again for having me here today. Um, I, the good news is a lot of what I'm gonna tell you has already been covered here, but I will repeat the important bits and make sure that we cover some 
a little bit more nuanced. The slides are not super detailed, um, but really meant to help you identify and answer some of the questions that your patients may have and that your colleagues may have about what is happening with this vaccine and why we're so sure that it's so safe and so effective in all of our patients and all of us. You know, it's important to note that in the past, most vaccine production required growing vaccine, growing the virus or the pathogen in culture, inactivating it, purifying it, modifying it in some way, oftentimes extracting proteins from it and that sort of thing. That kind of takes forever. And you can see that none of the none of the vaccines that use inactivated virus or, or live attenuated virus are available on the market. Now, the real reason that this is so quickly uh, able to come to market is because it uses this new mRNA technology, which isn't quite as new as many of us think that it is. Um, and that allows us to basically go from making macaroni and cheese, for example, with um, starting with only a cow and some wheat, and now being able to make macaroni and cheese from a box. You know, the previous SARS vaccine was tried using this messenger RNA technique, and so substituting in with the new spike protein was very simple and moved us into a place that we could do this quickly. Now, all of you know exactly how this works, um, but it is important to have a good way to explain to people that this is not something that's going to get back into your own DNA. It is um, making spike proteins. It helps borrow your cell's machinery to make little spike proteins, which act a little bit like a wanted poster for the COVID virus. And they tell our immune system, as you know, um, that this is what they need to look for. Some pieces that I think are sometimes missing in what we talk about this vaccine is that the second dose is extremely important, especially we think it will be important in individuals with poorer immune systems, such as patients with lymphoma. So that first dose really primes the immune system and gets some recognition, but it's the second dose that really gets people's immune systems to develop what we call, you know, the memory cells that are going to provide longer term, more durable, more reliable immunity. And that is important as we start having discussions about putting off that second dose. Certainly some people who are, I think that may be actually more risky in individuals who are immunocompromised than it is in individuals who are immunocompetent. And so I would advise against delaying that too long. Three to six weeks is probably fine, but much longer than that, can, you know, sort of what the United Kingdom is doing may be too long for some of our immunocompromised individual, and it may be more like starting from scratch. And so doing what you can to advocate for your patients, getting their second dose on time or as close to on time as possible, I think is going to provide good outcomes. Now, this is based on some immunology and experience with immune responses and less on, and, and what we saw in even normal hosts with the two doses, but uh, there's very little data to actually rely on that, but still I think sticking to the scheduled dosing uh, regimen is the right thing to do. So as you know, emergency use authorization, you are very familiar with using emergency use authorization um, medications and drugs all the time. These uh, messenger RNA vaccines actually have been tried for many other illnesses before SARS-CoV-2. They were attempted to be used for Zika, attempted to be used for dengue, and were not successful in being able to create a good immune response, possibly because of the differences in, in the way those viral pathogens create immunity in humans. The coronavirus with its spike protein is such an obvious target and such a sort of slam dunk thing to make a messenger RNA for that uh, it's not surprising that it works better for this, but I personally was very surprised that it worked as well as it did. Um, in, uh, in those previous trials, patients did receive these messenger RNA vaccines and did not have any long-term consequences. An important question that's often asked by individuals who are concerned about these long-term consequences is, is that two month duration of that trial long enough to really know if there's gonna be a bad outcome related to the vaccine? And this is where understanding the history of vaccines is really important. In the past, there have been some vaccines that have resulted in untoward or unexpected events. There were some issues with the original polio vaccine. There were issues with other sorts of um, 
with Drivax and the smallpox vaccine, where individuals can become ill with the vaccine strain in a live attenuated vaccine. That's not going to happen here. There also have been some random sort of uh, autoimmune slash neurologic side effects similar to like GBS, which we saw sometimes in individuals receiving flu vaccines. Those all, while they may last much longer than two months, in the past, 98% of them happened in the first six weeks after a vaccine was administered. And so using a two month evaluation after the second dose really makes me confident and comfortable when there were literally none of those events. Those few cases of, um, of uh, Bell palsy that you may have heard reported in the media, there were actually more of them in the placebo group than there were in the trial group. Now, the duration of this immunity that you can see here, which has been touted many, many times, these are curves that you all are familiar with. The duration of this immunity is obviously something that has been um, sort of a corner that's needed to be cut. And I'm, I, for one, am thrilled that they cut that corner because the trial participants are still two to three months ahead of all of us in terms of their immunity and they're continuing to be followed. Now, unfortunately, the trial participants don't include any immunocompromised individuals. And that means that we just don't have a good idea about how this immunity is going to behave in our patient population with lymphoma or in people, frankly, like me, I have rheumatoid arthritis. And, um, and so I also am concerned about my immunity level. There's nothing we can do with this. There's no reason to believe that immunocompromised individuals are gonna have untoward side effects, but they absolutely certainly should get vaccinated and whatever immunity they can make is uh, probably better than I would have expected prior to these trials. The duration of it is maybe less than what is um, present in normal participants, but we won't really know when that extincts until we know when the normal participants extinct as they're being followed. It's important to note that we have tested antibody levels in some of our, in some of, at least in my clinic, in some of our profoundly immunosuppressed individuals, some people with congenital T cell abnormalities, that sort of thing, and found that they actually made great antibodies to this, which is unusual um, given that they are, you know, we held their, uh, you know, IVIG therapy and that sort of thing in order to try and get an immune response when we vaccinated these. There are some healthcare workers in that in that group in my clinic, just a few, but it is promising and gives me more confidence than, um, than I would have had before that. Another important thing to keep in mind about these vaccines is that there's a big difference between these serious adverse events like GBS or autoimmune disease, which have been seen before. Then there's the bad reactions or allergies. A lot of people think that the side effects that they feel from these vaccines are related to not tolerating some sort of chemical that's in there or having a delayed allergy or some sort of reaction. Now, to be honest with you, there are some allergies to these medications. There's a little bit more anaphylaxis with the Moderna than there is with the Pfizer vaccine currently, but this is so much less than with almost any other medication available on that it has come to market. Imagine if we gave everyone a dose of penicillin. People who have not had a history of anaphylaxis to penicillin would not hesitate at all to take a dose of penicillin. And yet um, we would probably find uh, hundreds of anaphylaxis cases a day if we tried to give that to millions of people. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about that risk of allergies, actually much, much lower than it is for trying any new medication. And most of the cases of anaphylaxis have not been in individuals who are atopic or who've had previous significant allergies, um, excepting those who are allergic to um, polyethylene glycol. A reminder that polyethylene glycol is the main ingredient in Golightly and also in Miralax, so individuals who didn't tolerate their um, bowel prep because of allergy would not be suitable for these vaccines and should wait for a different class to come around. Additionally, there's um, a contraindication for individuals who happen to be allergic to something called polysorbate. This is an ingredient that's often used in beauty products and in some medications, it sort of sticks things together and creates emulsions. And it um, many people will have it enlisted in the ingredients of things that they use. And if they tolerate that, then they'll probably be all right in receiving the vaccine. They don't need to worry about that, even though it's something they might not have heard of. Now, Arthas reaction, which is probably going back way into your medical school days, that type three immune response of immune complex deposition in a local area called an Arthas reaction after a vaccine administration 
is happening in, in recipients of the Moderna vaccine. It doesn't seem to happen in Pfizer. It seems to happen after the first dose of Moderna. It happens about a week after the injection is given and people get a red, swollen, tender, you know, all that rubor, calor, dolor, um, all of that in the arm. It's often thought of as being allergic and people are often recommended to take antihistamines. That may help if there's some itching. But to be honest with you, um, the best thing to do is to give ibuprofen. These will last for about a week and they will go away. They should not be considered an allergy. Um, these uh, medications, these, these drugs, the the messenger RNA actually degrades within about an hour after the dose is given. And so all of your immune response is centers around that arm and the associated lymph nodes. So you can definitely see uh, how you could end up with a big immune complex deposition right there. It is recommended that you switch to the other arm if you have a significant reaction in one arm um, for the second one. Now, the actual effects that people talk about most with this vaccine aren't related to any of these bad things. The vaccines have no, um, no uh, preservatives in them whatsoever. And the side effects are actually, as you know, just examples of our immune system actually fighting off the COVID. It's getting a trial run of practice. And that's what we're seeing. Many, many patients, somewhere between we have Pfizer at University of Chicago, we're seeing about 30 to 40 percent of individuals have febrile reactions uh, sort of in the in the garden of fe not everybody's having fever but certainly um, not feeling well many of you have experienced this with uh, Moderna it's about the same it's less than half but sometimes it feels like it's almost everyone we're also hearing interestingly of some people feeling not great a week after their second dose and individuals who've had COVID seem to have that same reaction after the first dose and then be fine after their second dose which makes the question whether or not they even need the second dose which will be something for us to learn in the future again just a reminder that the adverse events in the trials were greater in the placebo groups than they were in the trial purchase in the in the drug groups and so there's really aside from sore arm at administration site and so there really isn't anything to worry about in this situation um, it, you all understand why we need to have a vaccine. The goal is to get people from the susceptible category to the immune category without having them be infectious. And that leads me to an important piece of what's going on with these vaccines. So the vaccine trials did not really look at whether or not people had great um, mucosal immunity because it's hard to do and we needed to cut corners and be done. So there is a possibility that individuals who may break through and develop infection. Certainly about 5% of the trial participants did that in, in the trials, they ended up with infection, but none of them had serious infection, which led to a lot of questions about how many patients may have broken through with subclinical infection and could they have passed it on to other people. Of course, we expect that their viral loads and their, their time of infection and infectious period should be much less than the individuals who have full-blown COVID, but there is still that potential. And so it is important that we continue to wear masks, keep our distance, and be careful until we have a sort of a, a thicker blanket of immunization in our communities. Um, I, for one, think that it's highly unlikely that we have a lot of people breaking through, but that um, that possibility justifies continuing mask use, at least in the short term. I, of note, with the new variants coming through, there is some concern, especially about the South African variant. Obviously, the Moderna uh, announced a couple of days ago that they're going to be creating a third dose booster that is meant to be directed directly at this, the spike protein mutations that happened in the South African variant because there is just not as effective. It stops people from having severe COVID, but it doesn't. It certainly results in more of these subclinical or low um, posse symptomatic individuals. Now the the Brazilian variant, it's not clear, but that variant developed in a place where the vast majority of the individuals were immune to the original COVID strain. And that strain, so that strain uh, developed out in an immune population, which is very concerning to us, but we don't know whether or not these vaccines are gonna work. The UK B117 variant does appear to be similarly effective as wild type. And at that point, I am finished and ready for questions. So thanks again. I hope that um, you all have gotten your vaccines like I have and that you had at least an experience that you felt was worth it. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Landon. Um, we'll now begin our Q&A portion of the program. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A box on your screen. 
we'll take as many questions as possible. Um, I know every presentation today was really in depth, and if you want to watch it after the fact, we'll also send you a recording. So just in case you you missed anything and you didn't get your question answered, you can always go back and listen to the presentation. Um, and so our first question of the day is for Dr. Sen. Um, when you listed guidelines from the ASH panel, you listed use protective growth factors liberally. Can you define and talk more about protective growth factors? Sure. I, you know that really relates to drugs like GCSF, which are a white blood cell booster, for example, that can be used after some chemotherapies to try and reduce the uh, lowering of the neutrophils, which are a part of our white blood cell system to fight off bacterial infection. Um, so, you know, it's quite common when people get cytotoxic chemotherapy that growth factors to boost the white cells back faster are used, although sometimes they're only used in older people. Sometimes they're used if the chemotherapy is more intense only. So th the idea is that to maybe lower the threshold for using these, and the reason is that, you know, if we boost the white blood cells back faster and, and lower the risk of, of the immune suppression, that people might be less likely to succumb to bacterial infections. So it, it, it's it's sort of a, a side benefit, you know, it, it, the idea is people have less bacterial infections, they'll have less complications, warranting doctor's visits, emergency room visits, hospital stays, and all of that uh, obviously would lower the risk of, of contacting COVID-19. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is for Dr. Mado. Regarding CLL and COVID-19, what about CLL increases the risk from a COVID-19 infection? That's a great question. Um, it's a little bit speculative at this point, but it, you know the general feeling is that it's probably not CLL specific, but all patients who have a weakened immune system or they're immunocompromised either from the disease itself or from the therapies may not be able to clear the virus effectively or may not be able to mount an appropriate inflammatory response to the virus. So I don't, I don't know that it is CLL specific. I think probably, at least broadly, all hematologic malignancies um, um, should be included. But you know what immunologists have discovered about CLL over the years is that they, you know, patients have um, immune dysfunction in multiple compartments of their immune system. Their B cells, which are the cells that make antibodies, don't work so well. Their T cells are not forming the appropriate connections that they need to f to fight infections. Another type of cell called the NK cells are also not particularly effective. So multiple arms of the immune system have become weakened or dysfunctional because of the, 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 the leukemia. And then on top of that, the therapies we give patients can add additional um, uh, immunocompromise to patients. So multiple arms of the immune system are affected. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mado. Um, our next question is for Dr. Landon. If I get a vaccine and my family does as well, are we safe to be around each other? Or what precautions do I need to still take once I get the two doses? Yeah, so my general recommendation is that um, people continue to use all of the precautions that they have been using when in public and around individuals that are not sort of part of their bubble or their quarantine family or whatever you want to call it. But it is appropriate, I think, that as um, as more and more people are immunized and as your family gets immunized, it would be appropriate to sort of make your bubble a little larger and bring in some more people who are um, who are also immunized. I think that's pretty reasonable. The time when we think it's safe to do that is two weeks after the second dose. We certainly are seeing people get sick between dose one and dose two, so that uh, I wouldn't consider yourself immune until two weeks after that second dose. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Sen, what timing is best and being used as standard of care for vaccines post-treatment, specifically for patients in remission? after a stem cell transplant and after chemo? You know, I, I think that's um, a really difficult discussion, and, and I think it's best to have that discussion with your own healthcare provider so that they can examine your own particular circumstances. I, I think, you know, our expectations is that the farther people get away from treatment and the more their immune system rebounds from treatment, more likely they'll have a, a better response to the vaccine. However, you know, that needs to be counterbalanced with the risk of putting the vaccine off and, and knowing that, you know, their 
delaying any protection that that vaccine might provide. So uh, I think it's going to represent a balance. And, you know, in my own patients, for the most part, you know, if there's some immediate, um, you know, and resolvable immune problem, if it's a matter of just a few weeks, I might say wait it out. But many of the treatments we have do cause prolonged immune suppression. And, and I'd say that there's probably more of a advantage to getting the vaccine when it's available and then reconsidering down the road, you know, when the immune system's fully recovered, whether or not booster shots, for example, might be something to consider. And, and that's something that we don't know enough about yet through the available information. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sen. Um, Dr. Mado, can you talk about rituximab maintenance and how that might affect vaccine efficacy? Sure. Um, great question. Not particularly relevant to, to CLL patients, but lymphoma patients, particularly those with indolent lymphomas like follicular lymphoma, uh, may be on long-term maintenance of rituximab up to two years. Um, there is a suggestion with other vaccines that um, suppression of B cells long-term may suppress the ability to make antibodies, and of course, uh, that's primarily how most vaccines work. So um, there's been some data to suggest that they, these types of drugs like rituximab may suppress the efficacy of vaccines. Of course, I'll, I'll note that we've never really tested a RNA vaccine in this particular context, and certainly there may be additional modes of um, efficacy for these vaccines, including uh, activation of T cells. So uh, I would argue that there's, there may be a chance of decreased efficacy, but it's something that really needs to be studied. And I would not compromise what would be considered by your individual doctor to be appropriate care in order to try to improve the potential or theoretical uh, success of a vaccine. Great. Thank you so much. Um, well, this is close to our final question. Um, Dr. Landon, can you talk more about the vaccines that are awaiting approval? Um, for example, AstraZeneca, which I know Dr. Mayo touched on briefly, and Johnson & Johnson. Are they um, live? How might that be different for immunocompromised patients? So none of the vaccines that are currently um, in the sort of next group to be uh, approved are live vaccines. Both the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines are adenovirus DNA-based vaccines. So they work a lot like the messenger RNA vaccines, but they use adenovirus to try and get into the cell. And then they um, use, they harness our cells machinery to you to translate that DNA into messenger RNA on its own. And then that messenger RNA is transcribed into um, the same spike proteins. They are, seem to be very effective. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is due to come up for EUA in just a couple of weeks. And the sort of the previews we've gotten from the company are that it's working very well. So I am uh, very excited about that. I haven't, obviously none of us have seen the data yet, but we will have it soon. So hopefully that will come up for EUA very soon. The AstraZeneca had some mixed data originally, but has been approved in the UK. And I think will come up soon for us as well. And that's really gonna improve our um, sort of the, the a number of doses that we have available. The best thing about the J&J &J or Johnson Johnson vaccine is that it's only one dose. And it's a lot, you can uh, get a lot more people vaccinated when you only need half as much. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Landon. And uh, thank you also to Dr. Mato and Dr. Sen. This has been wonderful, um, really comprehensive. Um, I know we got a lot of questions and we weren't able to get to all of them, but I know everyone really appreciates uh, the time and work you gave to give us this presentation today. So um, thank you to all of us. And also thank you to everyone on the call. Uh, we, found, we hope you found it both informative and also hopeful. We'd like to thank our sponsors again for making this program possible, Genentech, Cario Farm Therapeutics, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Please remember if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma, you can reach out to the LRF helpline at 800-500-9976. Also, at the conclusion of this program, you'll receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. I'll ask that you please take a few moments to complete this, as these are very important to helping LRF ensure that we deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us, and have a wonderful day.